Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. My name is Russell Shorto. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute, which is an independent American culture center based here in Amsterdam. And on behalf of the Institute and the Nieuwe Kerk, uh, thank you all very much for being here. We, um, I we were very pleased when the Nieuwe Kerk asked us uh, to we're getting, there's no light up here, so both um, of the speakers are going to read, and so we hope we have some light here by then. Um, I, and I um, just want to, I'm very grateful, we were very grateful when the Nieuwe Kerk asked us uh, to, to participate in the uh, For Halle over Freiheit uh, series. And uh, we immediately thought of Lawrence Hill and his wonderful novel, The Book of Negroes, and I'm very happy that this uh, came about. The program is an hour long, so I will not take uh, much of your time. Um, I will, uh, w Mr. Hill will uh, read and discuss, and then we'll have a moderated uh, discussion between him and Alka Hulst. So let me introduce our moderator. Alka Hulst is a... Uh, has uh, had a long career as a freelance writer for Freie Nederland, the Groen Amsterdamer, and other publications. He's uh, done interviews, reviews, he's written a novel, and uh, currently he writes for the NRC Handelsblatt. Please welcome Alka Hulst. Well, uh, thanks Russell. Uh, thanks to the John Adams Institute, to the New Kerk, and of course to Larry for having me. Um, I've prepared some remarks that I would like to read, and uh, after that I will introduce Larry, and then we'll get to the main bit of the program. Since the final decades of the 18th century, slavery has been a staple of African-American and Anglo-Saxon literature. Thousands of slave narratives have been recorded, of which some 150 were published in book or pamphlet form life stories that were meant to further the abolitionist agenda, to elevate slaves, or stimulate a deeper belief in God. Besides these slave narratives, a score of historical studies and novels dealt with the subject. In the 100 plus years between Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin and Toni Morrison's Beloved, the Institute of Slavery has been thoroughly charted. The Book of Negroes by Lawrence Hill a Canadian writer and son of social activists, fits into and enriches this tradition. This astonishingly well-researched novel, though fiction, reads like a slave narrative. It's the autobiography of Aminata Diallo, an intelligent, erudite, and self-willed slave. As an 11-year-old in the middle of the 18th century, she has been captured by African slave traders in what is now Mali. Decades later, she has seen the African coast, South Carolina, New York, Nova Scotia, and England. Her life has been a harrowing exodus and odyssey all in one. The novel has many strengths, but today I'd like to, uh, to highlight one element. Aminata's life story underscores the importance of language and literature. They are essential in creating a solid identity and in conquering one's rightful place in society. As a child, during her, during her long march through the African heartland, Aminata decides to take on the role of storyteller. With that ambition, she arrives at Bans Island, an infamous slave depot that can be smelled from afar. When I was carried up the ladder and dropped like a sack of meal on the deck of the Tubabo ship, I sought comfort by imagining, imagining, imagining that I had been made a jelly and was required to see and remember everything. My purpose would be to witness and to prepare to testify. Aminata is put to work at an indigo plantation on St. Helena Island just off the coast of South Carolina. Hill confronts us with one of the great crimes inherent to the system, the way it tears apart families. A slave is perpetually trying to gather information on loved ones through what is called the fishnet. Like an older slave says, niggers got mouth like rivers. Our words swim the rivers all the way from Savannah to St. Helena to Charlestown and farther up. I done hear of our words swimming all the way to Virginia and back. Our words swim farther than a man can walk. When we find someone, up he comes in the fishnet. <laughs> 
being a child with parents from different tribes, Aminata already speaks two African languages, which gives her a natural advantage over other slaves. Also, her father has taught her the fundamentals of reading, in defiance of Islamic law. During her travels, first as a slave, later as a free woman, Aminata builds on her language skills, sometimes in a clandestine way and with the help of others. In the end, she has mastered a handful of languages, amongst others English and Gula, the slave dialect. It helps her to hold her own socially, intellectually, and economically. Slaveholders used to discourage... I'm, I'm going to get some light, that's nice. Thank you. Slaveholders used to discourage slaves from learning to read and write. A cultivated slave was a dangerous slave. In a poignant scene, Hill touches on this. When the indigo inspector for South Carolina arrives at the plantation, he suspects Aminata to be smarter than she lets on. Hill writes, Solomon Lindo, which is the name of the inspector, walked to a desk in the room, pulled out a quill and an ink pot, and wrote a message on a piece of parchment. He showed it to me. It read, Turn around, you will see your mother. I spun around. Nothing. I turned back. He smiled broadly. Little trick, he said, but I won't tell anyone. Eventually, the liberal Jew Lindo decides to buy Aminata from her master. Under his tutelage, she is able to feed her law for Swift and Voltaire. Also, she is able to make a little money as a freelance midwife. It's the first step towards freedom, but not one that has been made without paying a terrible price. History, the saying goes, is written by the victors. But that's not completely true. Afro-Americans have been trying for centuries to rewrite the dominant storyline. That was one of the primary functions of the 19th century slave narrative. The autobiographies of people like Henry Box Brown, who had himself posted to the free north in a box of dry goods, and especially Frederick Douglass, were printed proof that the black man possessed character, emotion, and intellect. They spoke across the boundaries of color and helped mobilize res resistance against the institute of slavery. In slaves, the discovery of the written word stirred up a longing for freedom. Douglas' master forbade him to study reading and writing because it for would forever unfit him to be a slave. Douglas, who is the 19th century icon of Afro-American emancipation, writes, These words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering, and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation, explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding has struggled but struggled in vain. I now understand, understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty, to wit the white man's power to enslave the black man. From that moment on, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. It's a sentiment that's echoed in the 20th century by W.E.B. Du Bois, founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, a still very important civil rights group. For Du Bois, social progress could only come by way of intellectual progress. It's telling that Aminata not only ends up as a language teacher, but that she, that she also, as a scribe, gets involved with the Book of Negroes, the real historical document from which Hill's novel takes its title. Aminata registers the many slaves that, in the early days of the American Revolutionary War, emigrate to Nova Scotia to live in freedom. Some of them, supported by British, British abolitionists, will in time go on to Africa, founding Freetown, the city of freed slaves. Since the 19th century, the days of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Beecher Stowe, a lot has changed. Literature is no longer the dominant force it used to be. Before the invention of cinema, radio, television, or the internet, the printed word was practically the only form of mass communication. Now, literature is in decline, something that I, as a novelist, novelist, am confronted with every time I peek into my wallet. Still, written language is important, maybe even more so, 
Despite the bomba bombardment of imagery, we live in a very wordy world, one that at times seems to be made of folded forms. Emancipation, liberation and self-realization still come by way of conquering language. Even though the Book of Negroes tells of a story many of us would rather forget, this is a lesson that remains as relevant today as it was in the heyday of slavery. Thank you. And now I would like to give the podium to Lawrence Hill, for whom we all came. <laughs> thank you very much, Elka, and thank you to he or she who brought the light. I very much appreciate uh, the invitation uh, from Russell Shorto and his colleagues at the John Adams Institute to speak with you today. Thank you so much as well to, to Niwa Kirk for hosting this event and making it possible. Thank you as well to Ilantis Publishers. Really, there's no greater honor as a novelist to have energetic, enthusiastic, uh, intelligent uh, publishers in other countries bringing your words into other languages so that readers around the world can discover them. And so I'm thrilled that uh, Alantis has brought out the Dutch edition, Het Neger book, forgive my pronunciation, in Dutch, uh, uh, of the Book of Negroes, and, so, and to bring me here for a week to talk in various places in the Netherlands as well as in uh, Belgium. Uh, and thank you, Alka, for introducing me today and for those introductory comments. I want to start on a lighter note. Um, my first experience in traveling outside uh, North America uh, was at the age of 17. I was in between my uh, second, last, and final year of high school, and I'd won an, uh, an academic scholarship. And instead of doing the responsible thing and saving the money, I used it to come traveling in Europe. And uh, I had a backpack with a Canadian flag stitched on the back because I was afraid that people might think I was American. And so I traveled around the Netherlands for a month and many other European countries for about 12 weeks in, in 1974 at the age of 17. And um, I came to Utrecht uh, one day and I stayed in a, in a youth hostel. And uh, I'd been in the city for a few hours and promptly got lost. And I, I had no idea how to find my way back to to the youth hostel. And I spoke French and Spanish, but I, I didn't speak a word of Dutch. And I, and I was trying to ask myself, well, who could help me? Who would be a likely person to explain to me how to find my way back to the youth hostel? So I stood on the corner of, of a central area in Utrecht, looking around, watching people go by for five minutes, trying to decide who I would approach. And I had an afro that, that was about this big, and, uh, and I looked very dark as I'd been in the sun for months, and I had a knapsack, and my jeans were torn, so I had to be thinking about who I would approach. And uh, finally, I saw a very, very dark-skinned uh, black man walking toward me in, in the city. And I thought, aha, a black man, he'll speak English. And so I walked up to him without thinking twice, uh, imagining that he was a cousin from Brooklyn or North Carolina, and just jumped into a conversation in English without any hesitancy. And he looked at me and his jaw dropped and he had absolutely no idea what I was saying because of course he was from Zaire and, uh, and spoke uh, French very well, which I found out. So I switched over to French, but instantly at the age of 17, I discovered how foolish I was and how foolish that assumption was that because he was black, he would of course speak English and be able to answer my questions. And obviously I was associating his skin color with my own um, family background and with the language that was associated with it. So I assumed that uh, he would speak English. So that was my introduction to Utrecht, but I got beyond it. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about freedom and to sort of link my comments and readings from the Book of Negroes to the issue of freedom itself. I won't uh, spend a lot of time on this, on this grand subject, but I, will, I would like to make a, f a few comments. Uh, first of all, as you well know, it's so interesting that you're coming up to the 150th anniversary of two very significant dates. 1863 is both marking the end of uh, the slave trade in the Dutch colonies, and it's also uh, the date of the Emancipation Proclamation. So it's very interesting to see that uh, legal and physical freedom is marked by these two dates coinciding both with Dutch 
and American history. Perhaps as that 150th anniversary approaches, both countries will be able to celebrate it jointly. We also can think about literary freedom, and I want to stop and meditate on that for a minute. Alka mentioned uh, what anybody who's studied slave history knows, and that is how difficult it was and how illegal it was for a person whose liberty was stolen to learn to read and write. It was illegal in most places where slavery was practiced to learn to read, and it was illegal to teach a person who was enslaved to read as well. Yet, uh, also, as Alka mentioned, it's fascinating that despite these prohibitions, Hundreds or perhaps thousands of people went on to write slave narratives, having emerged from slavery themselves. And the impulse is profoundly assertive. This is my name. This is where I was born. This is when I was born, and I'm going to tell you my life story, and in doing so, assert my humanity and prove my equality to you. The slave narrative is the first form of literature produced and published widely by African Americans and by African Canadians. It is a foundation of all literature that moves from there in those two countries. And so the novel, The Book of Negroes, although entirely a work of fiction, a work of my imagination, sits on the literary genre of the slave narrative, and I was proud to write it. So we have literary freedom in terms of the strivings of enslaved peoples to acquire the knowledge that will liberate them in the world to which they've been brought. And we also have a contemporary concerns about literary freedom as well. Uh, several years ago, I was working as a volunteer in Mali in West Africa, and I, uh, it was extremely hot during the days, uh, maybe 40, 45 degrees, and so I take a break in the hottest uh, hours of the day from my tree planting and um, sit with an old man named Yusuf under a tree and just wait for the heat to fade, and we drink tea. And of course, anybody who's traveled to West Africa knows that tea drinking is a, a ceremony that takes hours in Mali. You don't just have a cup of tea in 15 minutes and call it an end. You have to heat up the water on coals and pour it many times and drink it and talk, and it stretches for all afternoon. And so I was having tea with Yusuf daily in this tiny village in the middle of nowhere in Mali, and Yusuf um, he was 84 years old, and he had always a magazine in his hand, and you could not stop him from reading. And his favorite magazine, really his only magazine, the magazine he was turning every day, the pages of which he was turning every day, was Paris Match, the trashy French fashion magazine. And that's because an international development worker had left a stack of Paris Matches in his village, and it was his only reading material. So I began to press him about this more. Well, why was he so anxious to read this magazine? What was it that charmed him so? And it wasn't so much the magazine, but Yusuf, at the age of 84, had just learned the previous year to learn how to read. There had been a national literacy campaign, and he had benefited from it, and he did not want to spend any remaining day of his life without reading, having learned at the age of 83 to do so. And it reminded me of a gift that we in Canada and you in the Netherlands perhaps take for granted, and that is a gift of literacy. And still to this day, there are many people around the world certainly including Canada, who are functionally illiterate, who are incapable of reading and savoring the, the joys uh, of the written word. And so it's good to remember that, literary freedom as well. Finally, there's, a, there's an issue of the freedom of movement, and we've seen many tragic examples of refugees attempting to write their lives, to seek safer territory to live in, and dying en route, or being allowed to die en route. We have very recent examples of that in Europe, uh, trying to find a place where they can live in dignity. I also should ask or answer the question, well, what is the contemporary relevance of this novel to today? Why is uh, the issue of Aminata's freedom relevant to us today? And it's worth pointing out that in the year 2011, experts indicate that as many as 30 million people, primarily women and children, are currently held in contemporary forms of slavery. It's a different sort of beast, it's a different sort of social injustice, but the basic tenets of immorality are still in place, impeding women, men, and children from moving freely and finding their humanity. So slavery continues in altered forms to this very day, affecting millions and millions of people. Canadians and the Dutch perhaps share a similar disinclination to examine their own slave histories. I'm going to speak 
in more detail about Canada and the United States in a minute in discussing the Book of Negroes. But there are many examples of this disinclination uh, in, in many stark examples of, of slavery in our own national histories. And I'll just cite two very short examples to sort of clarify the matter and to, and to make it more tangible. I've read that a man named Solomon Duplessis is buried here under uh, the Newakirk Church. And um, uh, Solomon Duplessis was the father of one of the, apparently one of the most cruel slave owners of all of Suriname, whose name was Suzanne Duplessis. I won't uh, detail the, the unspeakable crimes that she committed against those that she purported to own, but it's a fascinating history that can easily be discovered uh, in, in reading. Um, in Canada, um, one of the starkest examples of, of slavery and its cruelty took place in 1734. Slavery in Canada dates back to 1628, when we find the first documented slave in Canada, a young boy named Olivier Lejeune from Madagascar, who's enslaved in Quebec City uh, in the French part of Canada. At any rate, in 1734, a young woman of Portuguese origin, whose name was Marie-Joseph Angelique, finds herself enslaved in Montreal. Montreal is a big city now, but it was a very small city in 1734. And at the point of discovering that she's about to be sold by her slave owner to another owner in another jurisdiction, she apparently, or she is alleged to have rebelled and to burn down her, her owner's home. This fire spreads and ends up burning down about a quarter of the entire city of Montreal. And Marie-Joseph Angelique is, uh, is arrested and detained, and she's tortured, and she, her legs are broken, and she's forced, as her legs are being broken, to confess to the crime uh, of arson. And, and after being tortured, she's publicly executed. And it's, uh, it's one of many scandalous examples of the practice of slavery in our own country, in Canada. I mention it because, of course, Canadians are, are, are quite happy to um, ignore this history and to think about the abuses of human rights that took place in the United States. It's much more comfortable to wave an accusatory moral figure at the nasty, dastardly Americans than to think about the practice of slavery over, over centuries in Canada itself. And so one of the reasons that I chose to write the Book of Negroes was to dramatize and elucidate the story of slavery and freedom in Canada and its connections to the rest of the world. Although many people like to imagine that uh, black history is distinct in different corners of the world. Suriname has its black history, uh, Jamaica has its, the United States has its, Canada has its, different parts of Africa have its. I'm interested in finding things that unite these experiences and I, and I couldn't find a better way to illustrate the unity of the diaspora, the movement back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean, the ways that peoples of African descent around the world are connected. I couldn't find a better way to illustrate and dramatize this story, the search for freedom, than to talk about the black loyalists. So I'd like to take a minute to describe who the black loyalists were and then to read you a short excerpt from the Book of Negroes. The American Revolutionary War uh, of course, is a war that stretches over about seven or eight years, from 1775 to about 1783. And um, it is a war that sets in motion, of course, the desire of the British colonies to create an independent country that goes on to become the United States of America. And uh, this, is, this war pits the British uh, against the, well, other British who end up becoming the, the American rebels. And um, during this long, bitter, uh, violent, bloody, uh, revolutionary war, the British do everything they can to win in their ultimately losing efforts to quash the American Revolution. And one of the things that the British do during the war in their attempt to, to stymie the American Revolution is to issue two very public written proclamations promising African American slaves that if they profit from the chaos of revolution and flee and come behind, flee their plantations and come to serve the British behind British lines during the war, they will be guaranteed their liberty and their security at the end of the war. As a result, thousands of black people flee slavery and come to serve the British uh, behind the British military lines. Interestingly, it's very hard to be an American or an informed Canadian and not to know that the first person to die in the American Revolutionary War was a black man 
by the name of Crispus Attucks, who was sided with the rebels, with the patriots, the Americans, who went on to form their own country. But very few Americans and Canadians and others know that although Crispus Attucks was the first to die, first black to die, and the first person to die in this war, siding with the rebels, thousands of others chose to serve on the side of the losers, the British. The British controlled Manhattan, which is an island, throughout almost the entirety of the American Revolutionary War. And so it was to the island of Manhattan that approximately 3,000 blacks sought refuge during this long seven or eight year war. The bottom, the southern tip of Manhattan was urbanized. Most of the northern part of Manhattan was, of course, uh, still uh, forested. It was undeveloped. And so it was the southern mile or so, the southern one and a half kilometers of Manhattan that thousands of blacks seek refuge, um, serving the British in every way possible. Soldiers, spies, cooks, road builders, prostitutes, midwives, you name it, they're doing it with their children in tow, desperately hoping to cash in on this promise of freedom at the end of the war. The problem is that the British lose the war. And, and when they lose the war, they begin to evacuate Manhattan by ship, as it's an island, as quickly as they can. Blacks are desperate to get out, and finally a deal is struck. And the British promise Af African Americans who served them in the war that if they can assert their service and prove that they served for at least a year, that they will be transported by ship over a nine-day journey from Manhattan to the east coast of Canada, to Halifax, Nova Scotia, in Nova, uh, on the Atlantic seaboard. A few of them go to Germany, the United Kingdom, the Caribbean, and Quebec City, but 95 or 96 percent of these 3,000 black loyalists go from New York City to Halifax, Nova Scotia, on the Atlantic Ocean of Canada. And uh, before they can travel, they have to have their names entered into a British military ledger known as the Book of Negroes. This is a document, the first document in North American history that provides extensive genealogical and biological information about thousands of black people uh, in a public in public documented way. Their names, their ages, where they were born, what they looked like, who used to own them, how they came to flee slavery, where they're traveling to in, in, uh, in Nova Scotia, what's the name of their ship, who they're married to, that kind of thing. This document called the Book of Negroes, uh, you have to have your name entered into it before you're allowed to sail. And my character, Aminata, also participates in the writing of this book and has to have her name entered, entered into it as well before she can sail from Manhattan to Nova Scotia. After 10 years of broken promises in Nova Scotia, meeting with slavery, segregation, anti-black race riots, and general deprivation, uh, the, the Americans who become Canadians, who are black, who are in Nova Scotia, are so disgruntled and unhappy with the, their uh, civil rights violations that they choose, many of them, voluntarily to leave, accepting an offer from British abolitionists sanctioned by the British Parliament to sail across the ocean and set up the colony of Freetown in Sierra Leone on the west coast of Africa. 1,200 men, women, and children all black, sail in 15 ships on January 15, 1792, from Halifax, Canada, to Freetown, Sierra Leone, constituting the first back to Africa exodus from the Americas. Uh, some people might imagine that the first blacks to leave the Americas and go to Africa were coming from the Caribbean or from the United States. No. The very first exodus, uh, and a large number, comes from Canada, 1792. It's an amazing story. Uh, it turns out that many of these migrants were not only going from Halifax to Sierra Leone, they had been born in Africa, enslaved, brought into the Americans in slavery, got up to serve the British during the war in New York City, came over to Nova Scotia, Canada after the war, and go back to Africa in the same lifetime in which they were born and abducted from Africa. It's a story that I'd never heard about before researching this novel, and I just ha had to write it when I learned that astounding fact and discovered to my great luck that no novelist had turned his or her pen to it before. So, um, to finish, uh, a, 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 and then to proceed to a discussion, I'll just read you a short excerpt in the voice of Aminata, the woman who tells her life story, the autobiography that becomes this novel. Uh, I'll just share with you a little bit in the voice of uh, 
Aminata. The year is 1802. She's in London. She's gone to advocate for the abolition of the British slave trade, which finally takes place in 1807. And this is what she has to say. The other day, they took me into a London school, and they had me talk to the children. One girl asked if it was true that I was a famous Mina D, the one mentioned in all the newspapers. Her parents, she said, did not believe that I could have lived in so many places. I acknowledged that I was Mina D, but that she could call me Aminata Diallo if she wanted, which was my childhood name. We worked on my first name for a while. After three tries, she got it. Aminata, four syllables. It's really not that hard. Aminata, I told her. She said she wished I could meet her parents and her grandparents. I replied that it amazed me that she still had grandparents in her life. Love them good, I told her, and love them big. Love them every day. She asked why I was so black. I asked why she was so white. She said she was born that way. The same here, I replied. I can see that you must have been quite pretty, even though you are so very dark, she said. You would be prettier if London ever got any sun, I replied. She asked what I ate. My grandfather says he bets you eat raw elephant. I told her I'd never actually taken a bite out of an elephant, but there had been times in my life when I was hungry enough to try. I chased three or four hundred of them in my life, but never managed to get one to stop rampaging through villages and stand still long enough for me to take a good bite. She laughed and said she wanted to know what I really ate. I ate what you eat, I told her. Do you suppose I'm going to find an elephant walking about the streets of London? Sausages, eggs, mutton stew, bread, crocodiles, all those regular things. Crocodiles, she said. I told her I was just checking to see if she was listening. She said she was an excellent listener and wanted me to please tell her a ghost story. Honey, I said, my life is a ghost story. Then tell it to me, she said. As I told her, I am Aminata Diallo, daughter of Mamadou Diallo and Sira Koulibaly, born in the village of Bayo, three moons by foot from the grain coast in West Africa. I'm a Bamana and a Fula. I'm both, and we'll explain that later. I suspect I was born in 1745, or close to it. Thank you. Let's see, does this work? This works. Thank you, Larry. Um, first off, I would like to ask you a question about the title because I don't think many, many people probably don't know that in America and I also think in Australia and New Zealand uh, the book was published under uh, another title which is uh, Someone Knows My Name which to the uninformed person like myself may seem like um, political correctness gone mad <laughs> uh, but you told me earlier that I'm mistaken. Maybe you can explain why it's not political correctness gone mad and how it came about that the title was changed. Sure, I'd be happy to explain the fact that the title has different names even in English. Most English-speaking countries in the world, the UK, Canada, Australia, uh, uh, Kenya, uh, South Africa, etc., uh, published it as the Book of Negroes. But it, as you mentioned, in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, it's known as Someone Knows My Name. Why? Well, it came out first in Canada, as that's my country, that's where my first publishing deal was, and that's, I chose to give the book that title for the reasons I've already explained, um, to sort of commemorate and resuscitate a, a document in Canadian, British, and American history that's entirely unknown to ordinary peoples, certainly in North America. Um, when it came time to release the book in the United States, the uh, American publisher, W.W. W. Norton and Company, initially agreed to the title, but at the 11th hour, while I was on book tour in Germany, sent me an email. I was in Greifswald, up on the Baltic Sea, and they said that it had to change, that bookstores would not stock the book with the word Negroes in it, and that they had to change the title. I was, I was initially outraged, as perhaps you are still today, Auka, uh, and I had 24 hours to come up with a new title for the book. And finally, I decided to call it Someone Knows My Name, 
which was the best I could do in, in 24 hours. It was sort of a hats off to the famous American author, James Baldwin, and it was in tribute to the idea of the loss of naming of, of people who were brought from the Americas into Africa, uh, from Africa into the Americas. There's no greater way to disregard and to deny one's humanity than to refuse to acknowledge one's name. And so this title springs from that very issue. But you, you, could, you could understand the, uh, the trouble uh, Americans were having with the title, because Negro is, is, a, is, a, very, uh, is a, um, a label that has a, a completely different connotations there than it has for us. Precisely. I was initially angry that the title had to change, although this happens to Canadian writers all the time. It happened to J.K. Rowling when her first Harry Potter book came into the publication in the States. It also had to change title. Many British Canadian writers find their titles changing, entering the American market, so it's very common. Uh, so I was initially angry, although I felt I was in good company. Um, but. Uh, um, my, my, change, my thinking changed over time. I started touring Boston, Brooklyn, Manhattan, uh, Washington, Atlanta, uh, all over the States. I started touring and speaking to audiences exactly like this, uh, sometimes much larger, sometimes smaller. Um, and time after time after time, African Americans would come up to me after I'd spoken and say, it's a good thing you changed that title because I would never have come here today and I would never have bought or read your book if you'd called it the Book of Negroes. That word won't fly down here. And it's important to recognize how incendiary the word has become in urban America. It's not a good word to use anywhere, nor is it good to use in Canada. But in urban America, it's downright explosive. I sometimes joke that if you called somebody a Negro in Toronto, Canada, where I live, they'd look at you like you hadn't read a newspaper in 50 years. But if you call somebody, if you use the word Negro in Brooklyn, you'll get your nose broken. It's a, it's a fighting word. It's a, it's a highly insulting term now. It wasn't 50 years ago. When my father was born in 1923, he called himself a Negro right up to the age of 40 or 50, proudly. But language changes, and now it's a very pejorative term. So that's why the Americans felt uh, that title had to change in order to avoid completely insulting and alienating the African-American readership that was likely to come to the book. Mm -hmm. You, men you mentioned your father. Uh, I already um, mentioned in my, uh, in my uh, piece that uh, you're the son of uh, social activists, um, a mixed marriage, interracial marriage, uh, and you told me before that your parents actually had to um, move out of the country to be able to marry. Well, they married in the country. They married in Washington, D.C., but they left the Washington, D.C. the day after they married. Washington, although you don't think of it as south, if you look at a map of the United States, it is in the south uh, in, in racial terms and in terms of the racial politics of the country. And so they left the day after they married on the campus of Howard University and, and went to Canada and never turned back. So we, were, we the children of my parents, were all raised in, in Toronto, uh, Canada. Uh, you know, a couple was convicted six months after uh, one of the most interesting and colorful cases in American judicial history, judicial history. A couple was convicted about six months after my parents married in Virginia, just a, a short throw from where they married, um, of being interracially married. It convicted, uh, and this conviction was upheld in the, in the Virginia Supreme Court. Um, this couple was perfectly named. Their name was Loving. And um, anyway, my parents had to come to Canada. Um, do you feel that your parents being social activists uh, really formed your outlook on life? Well, certainly. Um, in, moral, in moral and political social terms? I sometimes uh, joke that every um, psychological disturbance that I have uh, can be traced back to having two social activists for parents. Um, but um, uh, on a serious note, for sure, uh, I'm profoundly influenced by their work and by their beliefs, and I very much incorporated their, their belief system and morality into my own work as a novelist. I'm not a social activist, although I support many socially activist causes, but um, uh, I'm a novelist, but I certainly embrace their own moral code Quite, quite fully. Mm -hmm. Well, some of that embracing you have done in Africa itself in the 70s and the 80s. You went there to do, uh, to work for NGOs, I think? Yes, yes, really uh, 
I mean, I grew up in a in a white affluent suburb of Toronto, and uh, trying to figure out exactly how to situate myself in the world and racially. How would I see myself in a in a suburb of Toronto that was entirely white, but that in which somehow I could not possibly be white? Where where would I fit in? And part of my journey to self discovery came from writing. I'm sure I became a writer because I grew up in a crucible of, of ambiguity. Um, but part of my journey. Uh, involved a great deal of reading as a teenager, uh, inhaling every book on my parents' bookshelves, and there were hundreds. Um, But also, I started to travel to find myself. I started to travel into black cultures. And since I couldn't find any in Toronto, where I was growing up in the early in the middle of the 1960s, I began to travel to Africa, uh, where I worked uh, many times as, as a volunteer with a Canadian NGO called Canadian Crossroads International. I'm still associated with them actively as a volunteer to this day. Um, and um, th- those experiences of working and living in rural West Africa influenced me profoundly and really opened up uh, my life as a writer. Well, I can imagine that if you go to Africa, you have a certain idea of what Africa is like, but also... Uh uh, a certain idea of your own heritage. Uh, did your um, outlook on, on that heritage and, and what Africa is like change just by being there? Well, certainly. Did my outlook on Africa and my own relation to it change as a result of being there? For sure. I mean, I, was, I began traveling to Africa at the age of uh, 22 uh, as a volunteer living. in again, I wasn't as a tourist in hotels, but living in tiny villages without electricity or running water in the middle of nowhere, planting trees and building houses and living and working with local people. This was in Niger, in Cameroon, and in uh, Mali. Uh, I think I went with the classic mindset of a typical North American black who seeks to be welcomed by the brotherhood, uh, welcomed by the mother continent. It's a naive but an understandable emotional response from a young person who's, who's seeking to find himself or herself and seeking to connect with the mother continent. Um, this wasn't necessarily going to happen, and uh, not every, to say the least, African that I encountered was prepared to accept my own racial identity. There were many hundreds of stories, many of which have been published, some very funny, some very sad, about Americans feeling so bitterly rejected when they go to Africa and find that they don't get the hug, the the genealogical hug that they were looking for. But um, I learned a great deal through this process, and uh, uh, it affected me profoundly. Most, I think, influentially, I just settled down, and I stopped learning to care. It didn't matter to me anymore after a couple of months what people saw in me or how they saw me or who they thought I was. I really didn't have to care. I knew who I was. I knew where I'd come from. I didn't have to seek anybody's approval. And so sort of moving into the thick of it allowed me to move past it and not to have to worry anymore about other people's perceptions of me racially. So yes, it did affect me a great deal. Uh, you said that uh, you came across the, the, the historical document, The Book of Negroes, while, uh, whilst uh, researching your novel. So it wasn't the starting point. In, the, in, in that sense. You, you were planning on writing another type of novel and ran into the, the Book of Negroes? How did that come about? Oh, well, I, I took the book, I took a history book from my parents' bookshelves, and there are a few, a few uh, scholars in Canada who, and in the United States who'd written about the document known as the Book of Negroes, this community passport documenting the exodus of blacks from New York City to Canada in 1783. So a few scholars had read, written about it for PhD students, but no ordinary Canadian or certainly no more than 10 or 15 in a country of 30 million knew this story. And so um, I was fascinated by the discoveries, uh, my own discoveries in reading these historical texts, but I sat on it for seven, six other books and uh, I didn't feel ready yet to write a novel in a woman's voice, in a woman's perspective. The story was just too big for me. And so I wrote six other books first until I felt ready to write uh, The Book of Negroes. So it really it sat with me for 10 or 15 years until I really stepped into writing the book. Um, I hear you, you sold the movie rights and actually wrote the screenplay already, co-wrote. Yes, yes uh, I have uh, co-written the screen, two drafts and now we're done of the screenplay and, and yes, the film rights were sold. Well, usually the, 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 um, making a, a book into, into a movie turns into a nightmare for the author. And we, had, we, have a, we have a very famous author, actually, in, in, a, in the Netherlands, Tommy Wieringa, who, who sold his, his bestseller uh, to a movie company and then uh, went into litigation to try to stop them making the movie. Uh, 
But you actually wrote the, the, the can you tell a bit about the, uh, the process involved and how, how you... Um, sure, how you sure. Well, well uh, of course, you long to have your book. If you're Canadian, you know, it's already hard to sell internationally. Canadian books, uh, it's difficult for them to get a foothold in, in international markets in the United States and elsewhere. And so the idea is to take the money and run um, and, to, and to use the money to finance the writing of another book or two. And this is my only work. And so um, I was happy to sell it. There were several who asked earlier for the film rights and we turned them down because it didn't seem serious. But a very respected Canadian filmmaker, a black Canadian filmmaker by the name of Clement Virgo, who's done many films and approached, and he was a perfect fit for the book, and uh, I was happy to uh, let him, through my literary agent, acquire the rights to the film. Uh, he, uh, I'm confident that he has uh, good intentions and that the chances are good that it'll be a good movie, but even if it's a bad movie, the book is still there, and um, it, it can't hurt the book. Uh, it can really, I think, only only help. The first thing you do, I don't know how it works in Europe, but in, in North America, unless you're extraordinarily famous, uh, you know, and can influence things that you couldn't normally influence, the first item of a contract involving the sale of a book to film is, is the waiving of one's moral rights. You give up the rights to control anything about the film, and that's the first item of the contract. Without waiving or giving up your moral rights, you don't have a film deal, and that's it. And so the first thing you do is have to give that up. So if you're not prepared to sort of take a chance and have faith that it will be good and to deal with the consequences if it's not, then you shouldn't sell your your book to film. If you're not prepared to deal with that, then just don't go there. But I, I'm not really worried about it. I, I mean, I think it should be an interesting and good movie, but if it's not, it, the book is, is still there. It's been a really interesting adventure. I, I, I was a journalist for many years before turning to writing novels, and, and the first thing you learn in journalism is a very healthy lesson, I think, which is not to take your own work too seriously. Editors are constantly ripping it apart and putting it back together. That's uh, true. And, and, you, and if you take yourself so seriously that you don't think anybody else can improve or change your work, you'll go crazy. So you have to learn to sort of ease up, realize that your work can be taken apart and put back together, improved, shortened, hacked apart. And, and it's actually a, a maturation process as a writer to learn that other people can help you improve your work. And that helped me adjust the idea of all the changes that are involved in moving the story from book to screen. Well, that the book is interesting to make uh, f for uh, uh, film companies is also a testament to its popularity. It, it was a very successful book. As I told, there, there have been a lot of books about slavery. Uh, can you pinpoint what in your book uh, touched, the, touched the nerve with the readership? Well, uh, uh, the writer is always the worst person to ask that question of. But, uh, I mean, really, I think the readers are the best ones to answer. But many have written to me or talked to me. So I'll just share with you what many of these readers have told me. Uh, so it's really what they're saying to me, which I'm now repeating to you. I suppose they like the fact that uh, a woman uh, uh, endures the, you know, the worst insults that one can throw at another person short of murdering them, but doesn't lose her own humanity or her own courage or desire to live well and to love well. And she transcends, in a way, the worst things that could happen to a person. And, and uh, people tell me that uh, they think about the Holocaust you know, or the Rwandan genocide, or the war in the former Yugoslavia, in the same light that they think of the transatlantic slave trade. And they wonder, you know, how it is that so many of us have people in our own family histories who survived these atrocities and who refused to be emotionally destroyed by them, who went on living and loving after enduring such things. And so the book is a testament to human resilience. And that's one thing that readers tell me they have liked. The other thing, uh, 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 to, t to mention is that it introduces readers to an aspect of, of Canadian and American and British history that was hitherto unknown to popular readers. And although slavery has been written about a thousand times, there's always something new and some new angle to explore. Love has been, been written about a million times and there's always a way to write another beautiful love story. So readers tell me that they appreciate having been introduced to a slice of, of black history that they never had heard about before. Uh, you said a little bit about the, re uh, the way it is relevant today, and this is also a way it is relevant today. Um, do you think there are... are, are, are I talked a bit about the, 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 the way that uh, language is so important in being able to emancipate, to, to, uh, 
to find your place in a society. And I think in Holland, it's, language has been a, a very big discussion uh, concerning uh, the position of immigrants, whether they, uh, should they uh, be forced to, teach, uh, to learn the, the local language uh, to help them assimilate. Um, do you think maybe there's also some resonance in your book with, with modern day uh, in, in that regard? I think so. Um, Aminata realizes, Aminata, the protagonist of this novel, realizes in coming to uh, the New World as a pubescent girl who's been stripped of her family and her clothes and her own heritage and her name, that uh, she must learn the language of these new people, the Tubabu, the white people. She must learn to, their language in order to figure them out and in order to escape. She wants, above and beyond all else, to go home. This guiding principle governs everything that she undertakes. She wants to go home, to return to her native village. So she must learn how to speak to black people in one form of English, to white people in another. She must also learn this new language called Gullah, which is the only uh, African and American language that is created that's new among slave communities in North America. So she's really got to learn three languages um, to survive and to thrive, and then she's got to learn to read and write as well as numeracy and, and map consulting. And so literacy to her isn't an abstract thrill. It's not uh, some sort of thing that's hard to uh, attach a real value to. Literacy for her is equated to escape, is equated to the ability to leave the land that she's been dragged to and to go back home. Literacy for us today is also a key to uh, success and to uh, moving through one's world. And even if one's stay in a place is transitory, without having opportunity to, to thrive in the language of people uh, around us, we, we, we can't really move forward very effectively. Well, the other side of the argument could be that um, learning the language of, of, of uh, the place you're going to also amounts to um, giving up part of your identity, of your cultural, cultural identity. Is that a fair point to make? I think it's a fair point to make, although I think that um, in practical reality, if you go to a place and you're going to be there for a long time, um, it's going to be very hard for you to move forward uh, with both feet if you cannot speak the language of the country that you've, you've come to. That doesn't mean that I believe that people should be arbitrarily forced to do things that they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about uh, what is an appropriate government policy, but in reality on the ground, it's extremely hard to find your way to work, to Just converse, yeah. if you cannot communicate with 99% of the people around you. Yes. Um, we'd like to open up for questions, uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, wait, wait, there will be a microphone. Oh, wait. I don't know. Um, you just explained about the Book of Negroes, the ledger that was made, but you did not explain why it was made. Yes, the Book of Negroes was made um, as a way of uh, placating the Americans. Um, as I mentioned, the British promised to evacuate uh, those who served them, blacks who served them after the war, or to, to save them, to, to liberate them. After the war, they were planning to evacuate them, or so they said. But during the peace treaty process, in which the British give up and the Americans win, they sign a peace treaty in Paris, ending the American Revolution. The British betray the very blacks that they'd promised to save, and they promise in this peace treaty, which you can see today if you read the peace treaty, that they will not evacuate any Negroes or other property belonging to the American rebels. They promised this to the Americans. So they break the promise they made to the blacks in signing the peace treaty with the Americans. But they begin to evacuate them anyway, regardless of the terms of the peace treaty. And George Washington, who will later become the first president of the United States, is so incensed by this that he meets with the British military commander, uh, Sir Guy Carleton, during this six-month period in which the British are evacuating, and he complains, Washington complains to Carleton about this evacuation. And Carleton responds to placate George Washington that they will set up a document 
called the Book of Negroes, and they will document every single black that they take out of New York so as to later compensate the Americans for this financial loss. So the idea of the Book of Negroes is created so that the British can get the Americans off their backs and have them less hysterical, less upset about the notion that they're evacuating their property from, Nova, from New York to Nova Scotia. Any questions? No. I really think the voice of uh, Aminata Diallo is very believable. It's a very believable feminine voice. And I was wondering, wh where did you vi find the voice? I mean, you're a man. <laughs> How, I, I've read a lot of books uh, by um, uh, male writers uh, who give w women a voice, and it's not a good voice. But your vo Amanita's voice is very believable. Thank you. Well. It helped a lot to practice some cross-dressing. <laughs> but seriously, um, what I did, I worried about this. I worried that it wouldn't work. I worried that it would fail or that people would make fun of it. I, I, so I, what I did was to give the main character my daughter's name, named her after my eldest daughter, of, eldest of five. And, um, and I asked myself every day, you know, what if this were my daughter? How would she have survived? How would she have made it through this nightmare? And I tried to invest you know, my own love of my daughter in the love of this character. I was not writing about my daughter. Obviously, this couldn't possibly be a biography of my daughter. But I just imagined the character to be my daughter. And I gave her my daughter's name. And just to step into it emotionally and to, and to try to believe. Um, first, I worked on the old woman's voice. There are really two voices in the novel. Both voices belong to Aminata. There's a voice, her voice as an old woman looking back on her life, and then there's a voice as she's progressing through life from her infancy on, uh, young childhood on, through adolescence and into adulthood. So really two voices. One moving chronologically through her life, and the other at the very end of her life looking back. And at first I had to find the voice of the old woman. Uh, I, lo I reached in. I, I don't know. I, I, I imagined the sound of my own grandmother and my aunts, people who'd cared for me a lot in my own childhood in, in, in the black side of my family. So I reached in and just tried to pull out something. I think that if you close your eyes and reach down as a writer, you'll find things that you don't even know are swimming around in your soul. And the process of writing really, honestly, uh, fictionally, involves sending that tube down into your heart and seeing what bubbles up that day. And so I just had to keep going and going and going until I could find the voice of the old woman. And once I had that, the rest fell into place. Yeah. I'll repeat. The question is, did I do a geographic pilgrimage as, pilgrimage as well as a, an imaginative one? How did I research the novel? Where did I go, if anywhere, to travel? The trips to, uh, to work in Africa took place when I was still a young man, and a long years before I, I, I began to write this book, d decades before. And so um, those trips were researched, but I didn't know it yet. I guess it was research in the way of lived experience. So um, when I started to actively write the novel, the writing and researching all happened together, and it stretched over a five-year period. Um, I traveled many times to the Sea Islands off the coast of South Carolina, uh, as much of the novel would take place there. I traveled to New York City. Um, I traveled many times in Nova Scotia. Uh, not so much, I did go to Halifax, but really the, the bulk of the story in Nova Scotia takes place on the south shore of Nova Scotia, about three hours by car to the south of Halifax in a community called Shelburne or Birchtown. So I went there often to do research. So I didn't have the money to go to Sierra Leone where part of the story takes place. And anyway, Sierra Leone was engulfed in an awful civil war at the time, so it wouldn't have been wise for me to go there. Uh, but I did, and I didn't have the funds to go to England. I didn't get to go to England until after the book won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize and the Queen invited me. Um, but, so that's when I got to go after the book was published. But, um, uh, but I did go extensively to New York City, uh, South Carolina, uh, and Nova Scotia. Uh, 
Yes. Front. Sorry. Um, I was wondering because I mean, Atar's survival um, um, seems to be laden with uh, coincidences and narrow escapes. Uh, well, it is. And um, one of the um, um, one of the um, uh, critics in the newspaper said, um, "This." can't be believed of uh, one character to survive so many things and still be believable. And then I started wondering that maybe to some extent, um, I mean, Atar's story is uh, a story that transcends um, individuality. But I don't know. So that's my question. <laughs> well, it, what really, what do I think of the idea that uh, the things that Aminata survives are just too many to be believed. Well, I, I think that it's a preposterous allegation, really, because all you have to do is look at the astounding abuses that, that slaves had to endure. And I only catalog a few of the many that a person like Aminata would have endured. Let's say, for example, in the novel, she's raped once. In reality, a woman such as Aminata might have been raped repeatedly. Um, the violations that she has to endure have to be toned down so the novel can be palatable and so a reader can actually have the heart to get through it. I think that a little bit of violence in, in kind of uh, dis despair and nightmare goes a long way in fiction. You don't actually have to catalog every single insult to one's humanity to sort of demonstrate the point of the abuses that they suffer. So really, I think that in fiction, especially when you're dealing with violence and tragedy, you have to tone, if you're writing you know, serious literary fiction, you have to tone it down a great deal to get the reader through it um, and, to, and to get yourself through it. So I feel that uh, when one really understands the things that, that, that slaves had to endure, whether they were in Suriname or in Canada um, or in many other parts of the world, and, and you consider that so many of them did survive, I don't think it's in any way unbelievable. It's just that it's hard for us to really face the horrors that people had to endure in this way. So we think that her survival is unbelievable, but her survival, I think, is really quite typical. I have a, I have a question. As I said, the, the, the novel is, is very deeply researched. Um, I can imagine being confronted with all, with, with the rape, with the murder, with with everything that happens, uh, that that uh, an immense anger wells up inside you, and you have to, m while writing a novel, kind of contain that. Did that happen at all? You know, no. Um, I I I don't really. Obviously, if you ask me theoretically or intellectually, do you feel angry about the abuses of slavery? Well, of course I'll answer yes. But I don't walk around with a kind of anger governing my impulses and my emotions. I, I'm, not, I'm not an angry person by nature. I think I'm realistic. I think I understand what our history is. But I don't feel that walking around angry actually serves me well or allows me to function you know, well or productively in my own life and, and in society. I'm not telling other people that they should or shouldn't be angry. But anger doesn't work well inside me and it tends to get in the way of me relaxing and, and living in the way I want to live. So so I don't feel that I'm an angry person, and I don't feel that I'm writing from a standpoint of anger or accusation or blame. I feel th all. that I'm writing from, from a standpoint of, of admiration, uh, uh, again, for the resilience uh, of the human spirit in, in this novel. And really, I'm writing a tribute to a woman's survival as opposed to an accusation about the horrible things that, that people did to her. And uh, that's really just my own kind of quirk quirky makeup. So I, I don't pretend to tell other people that they should or shouldn't be angry, but anger doesn't work well for me and it, it doesn't help me function you know, on, on a daily basis. Anyone? Yes. 
Uh, could you um, dwell a little bit upon the importance of maps and mapping in your uh, novel? Sure, thank you. The question is, I have an epigraph in the novel uh, quoting a poem from Jonathan Swift, and that relates to mapping and the discovery of maps in the novel. And could I quote, uh, could I mention that a bit? And thank you, for that, um, really. And that takes us right back to both Canada and uh, the Netherlands. I don't have to tell you that uh, uh, one of the most famous countries in terms of producing prominent uh, cartographers uh, including cartographers of Africa, were, uh, was n the Netherlands. And some of the most famous maps and the best known maps of um, Africa are being made by cartographers in the Netherlands in the 17th and 18th centuries, for example. And uh, I had never looked at maps of Africa uh, composed or constructed in this time frame until I started to um, research the novel. So I went to the University of Toronto Robarts Library and started to look at hundreds and hundreds of maps of Africa that had been created in this time frame. And I was absolutely fascinated uh, and entranced and disgusted by what I saw. And what I discovered it was that these are incredibly artistic, ornate, sometimes beautiful maps with cartouches or drawings lining the sides of the maps, up and down around the sides of the maps. You see tiny little paintings. But basically, the cartographers from Europe know nothing or almost nothing about the interior of Africa. They have rivers flowing the wrong way and things like that, but the, such as the, the Niger, uh, Niger rivers flowing the wrong way in some of these maps. But much worse, that they don't know what's in the interior of Africa because they haven't been there. Europeans haven't penetrated deep into the heart of West Africa until the very late 1700s. So they don't know what's there uh, through any kind of direct uh, European experience. So they just imagine. And what they do is that if they don't know what's, say, smack dab in the middle of West Africa, they just put an elephant down. Or maybe they'll put down a naked woman sitting on the back of a crocodile, literally. Or some preposterous kind of image, the European fantasy of what Africa might look like. And these are the decorations of these European maps uh, of Africa. And so when Aminata seeks to find her way back home, once she's acquired the gifts of literacy and numeracy and starts to consult these maps, uh, she finds nothing in these maps that will help her. And she's uh, very frustrated. And as a 21st century novelist, I had to ask myself, is it appropriate to give my character a degree of anger and frustration, or is that an ahistorical uh, observation? Is it okay to make her angry about what she sees in these maps, or is that too 21st century for this novel? And I wasn't quite sure what to do about that until I came across a poem by Jonathan Swift, written in 1733. And to my great delight, uh, I find Jonathan Swift satirizing the very same maps that Aminata is consulting in my novel. And he says of these maps in 1733 in his poem, so geographers in Africa maps with savage pictures fill their gaps and o'er uninhabitable downs place elephants for want of towns. And I was so delighted by this bit of poetry because it gave me permission to give Aminata a measure of anger as she herself sees these maps because she's born about 15 years after Jonathan Swift wrote that poem. Thank you very much. Um, uh, last question over there. Uh, one last and question. And then we unfortunately have to round it up. Why did you decide to, um, to have Aminata not reach her native village? Well, you know, why did I decide not to allow Aminata to reach her native village? And there's sort of a rule of thumb in fiction. Obviously, every rule is meant to be broken, um, but uh, and to be broken well. But you're not supposed to give your characters what they want. You know, you know otherwise it becomes a Rambo movie. You know, your, your, your character has to be stymied in some way. Your character can't really get exactly what she wants or he wants. And I felt that it would be really anticlimactic for her to go to make it back home. She tries. She tries she so desperately. She tries. I won't elaborate all the ways in which she tries. She gets very close, but she can't. And I didn't feel I could give her that. I felt that I had to lift the novel onto another plane at the ending. And I admire books that do that, that shift the plane of a novel onto another territory before the thing draws to an end. So I, I didn't feel it would be right. I felt it would be anticlimactic, and I felt there was nothing for her to go home to. <laughs>
that she had to find her home somewhere else. And home, ultimately, has to be what she carries around in her own heart. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, turning out. Uh, I once again would like to thank the new Kerk, would like to thank uh, Russell, would like to thank uh, the Adams Institute, Professor Ayantis, and of course, the man who we came out for, Lawrence Hill. Thank, thank you, you so much, much Okay. Thank you. Went yes, to they went there just a few decades after the loyalists went to Sierra Leone. So yeah, just a which little I bit find later. interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I find painting, interesting. photography, uh, clay sculpture. Yeah.